Chapter 17. Rick wouldn't have believed it, but he fell asleep on the chopper back to camp. The pilot actually had to shake him awake when they landed. He woke up disoriented and wondered for a second if he just dreamed the few last days. But the pilot said, I hear she's an amazing dog. And he knew it was all true. He and Cracker got off. Rick and Cracker trudged toward Rick's barrack while other men rushed frantically in the opposite direction. One glared at him and shouted, all available men. Then U-Haul himself went running past but ran back to say, what the heck are you doing? All available men. Rick opened his mouth, closed it, then said, I just returned from a special mission. He felt a little, well, important now. The Sarge seemed to be choking on his own saliva when he tried to scream as loud as scream. He looked at Rick as if he were a new breed of worm and screeched, is there something about the word all that you don't understand? There are men in trouble out there. Get yourself together and get your tail on a chopper. Rick said, what's going on? U-Haul said impatiently. We got two major battles going on. Lots of casualties. All available men. And he dashed off. Rick couldn't believe that all available men meant someone who just returned from rescuing four special forces soldiers and had barely slept for days. But when he got back to the hooch, every other handler was already gone. He kept thinking about the words, lots of casualties. So he got fresh supplies for himself and Cracker and jogged to the helicopter pad. Only one chopper was left, so he and Cracker jumped aboard. They neared a field with men lying in the distance. And when he and Cracker got off and the chopper left, the silence surprised him. Just the same, he crawled forward rather than walked. He spotted Uppy in a trench and made his way over to him. How's it going, Rick said. They broke the perimeter last night, but we established a new one and it's holding so far. We tried to get everybody available here when the perimeter broke, but there was another big battle going on, on 20 clicks away. It was already afternoon by now. This has been going on since last night. Yeah, the middle of the night. A gun fired, but just one. And then a few fired, and then silence again. And then Cracker noticed Tristy at the other end of the trench. A guy she didn't know was holding Tristy's leash. Where was 2020? She tried to pull herself up. Rick pushed her back down. Rick noticed Tristy too. He readied the gun and peered over the trench and saw 2020 lying on his side in the field, almost as if he were sleeping. At first, Rick just thought he was entrenched a little further out, but then he saw blood seeping from 20. Rick froze in place. He figured it, it was an adrenaline freeze again, but then he realized it was his subconscious comprehending that if he made even one more move, the momentum would carry him all the way to where 2020 lay. And then they would both end up hurt. But he had to do something. Where's the backup? He snapped at Uppy. My buddy's out there. It's too hot to get him now, Uppy answered, snapping his gum. Rick suddenly felt like grabbing that gum out of Uppy's mouth and stuffing it up his nose. Instead, he tried to stay calm. He said, as if Uppy were an idiot. But it's quiet now, Uppy answered. My best friend's out there, too. We've known each other since second grade, you know. Rick took in a breath. I'm sorry, man. I didn't mean nothing. I forget it. Then 2020 lifted his head to look up and a shot rang out. But it wasn't at 20. It was at Rick for sticking his head out of the trench. Savageness rose in Rick again. He wanted to blast every Viet Cong in the world to smithereens. Tristy started barking. Somehow she'd gotten off leash and was leaping into the air. 2020 screamed, no, Tristy, stay, stay. Cracker yelped. Rick shouted, Cracker, stay. Somebody grab that dog. Tristy, stay. A soldier lunged at Tristy, lunged at Tristy, but she was too quick. She lurched off. In mid-leap, a single shot rang out. Blood splattered in every direction, and Tristy fell like a stone, half in and half out of the trench. Rick and Cracker crawled frantically toward her in a, as a soldier pulled her back in. Something about the triumph of the Special Forces mission mixed with the horror of seeing blood spurting from Tristy, made Rick think he might be losing his mind. He cried out to nobody in particular, what the heck is going on? The force of his cry startled Cracker. She'd never heard anything like it from him, and maybe nothing like it from anyone ever. She'd heard cries of physical pain, but this was different, a different kind of pain, and also a different kind of Rick. She sniffed at Tristy, alive. She looked at Rick to tell him to do something. People could do things. Rick could hear 2020 crying out, Is she alive? Is she alive? 
The blood from Tristy's limp body oozed from her chest. She wasn't moving. Rick held her muzzle shut and blew air into her nostrils. She came back to life, whinnying like a horse. Rick blew more air into her nostrils, then hollered, Medic! Uppy said, the medic's got a pile of humans he's working on. But then Uppy tore off his shirt and pressed it against the wound. Rick continued blowing into Tristy's nostrils. Then she opened her eyes and looked right at him before closing her eyes and ceasing to breathe again. Come on, Tristy. He kept blowing, but she fell limp. He knew she was gone. Cracker also knew she was gone. Hey, Rick! It was 20. Rick didn't answer at first because he knew what the next question would be. But then he ended up hesitating so long that he realized 20 already knew what the answer was. 2020 didn't speak again. Rick gently set down Tristy's head and turned away. He didn't move for a long time. Cracker laid her body over Tristy's, but kept a paw on Rick. She knew she couldn't protect, protect Tristy anymore, but she still felt protective. When a soldier moved nearby, she snarled, and the soldier moved back. Tristy smelled muddy and bloody, and just like Tristy, except dead. Cracker had smelled rats and birds right after they died, and they smelled different after death. After Tristy had smelled different for a while, Cracker knew it was time to take care of Rick again. She pushed against him. She couldn't feel anything coming from him, like sadness or anything, and that made her feel worried. The hot sun slanted from the sky and eventually descended as Cracker planted, panted from the heat. Gunfire occasionally broke the peace. When evening fell, the trees loomed dark and large. Several times Rick thought he saw movement in the forest and raised his rifle, but it turned out to be a shadow. Rick squeezed Cracker to him and waited. A long time ago, one of Rick's uncles had taken him through the Mojave Desert in Southern California. Weird shaped trees called Joshua trees filled the desert, their limbs bent, seemingly misshapen, crazy human-like shapes. His uncle had told him that Joshua trees looked, like, looked human because they once had been in another life. He said the trees were ghosts and that each had a story to tell. Rick figured that after tonight, these trees by the battlefield would have some stories. Okay, I wanted to show you uh, for a minute. He was talking about the Mojave Desert. So I want to take you there. So let's look. Um, on Google Earth, and it'll take us from Cambodia, Mojave Desert in California. And you see where the Mojave Desert is. Okay, near the Sierra Nevada Mountains. And then here's a picture of, um, of course, you can't go to the Mojave, uh, the Joshua Tree National Park because of the COVID. Um, but I wanted to show you, here's a picture of a Joshua Tree, and here's some different things different creatures that live here, but there's also a Joshua tree, um, more Joshua trees. Um, and you could click on that and look at all these different pictures of Joshua trees. And there is an old legend about why they're shaped the way they are is because they, just, they, it's a native American legend because they used to be human beings and you see the way they stand. Um, and some of them are very, very old. Um, and they have like prickly um, leaves that are very um, sort of like what we might see on a, a pine tree or something. And it's because there's not a lot of water there. So they don't have a lot of surface to the leaves. And if you look, the fruit on them is somewhat like a pine cone even. It's not, it's, it's actually a flowering thing, but it looks like that. And I thought that was pretty cool. That's just because as you know, when they're um, 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 doing photosynthesis, it's transpiration, like when they're, um, they don't, so they don't lose a lot of water. Um, they gotta hold in all the water that they have. Obviously there's not, it's a desert, so there's very little rain. So they've just got these ways that they survive that way. So I thought that was pretty cool for you want to go ahead and see that. All right. So, and plus we needed to break a little of the, the sadness there. Okay. Okay. So now back to where we were. 
Okay, so we were talking about the weird shaped uh, Joshua trees, crazy human like shape. And uh, he was talking about how after the battle that had been in the field there, the trees that were standing around in the jungle there would have some stories to tell. Finally, mortar fire exploded in the distance. And you know, mortar are the bigger, the bigger shells um, that would be fired out of those launchers, like the one that I showed you earlier on. Uh, the howitzer gun that I showed you with the big wheels on it looked like a little skinny um, cannon almost. And I'll show you again later. Um, several guys shouted for joy, and Rick realized that he was one of the guys shouting. Illumination flares hiding, hanging on parachutes floated down, imbuing the sky with an eerie light and moving shadows across the jungle. So this would be like, excuse me, like flares that you would have alongside the road if you had a, if you broke down so people could see you. So they're, they're floating down um, in the sky from, from the friendlies. The lights slowly floated, floated to the ground, making the whole world seem inside out. So sort of like a, a film would be. Like you look at a picture, um, it would be the film that you would have developed, the negative impression. It was as if everything inanimate came to life and everything alive was ghostly. Rick didn't know whether the ache in his gut was real or psychological or whether it made a difference, which it was. For a long time, not a single shot broke the silence. The medic moved into the field to 2020, and then the doc, and other guy, carried him to an area with the other wounded. Rick went to talk to him, but the doc had started an IV, and 20 must have gotten a shot of morphine. Guys, that's a high-powered um, pain medication because he didn't seem to recognize Rick. Rick didn't sleep, or maybe he did. Sometimes in Nam, you couldn't tell. At one point, he was definitely awake. The clarity of the stars startled him. The moon had risen over the nip of palms at the edge of the jungle. Smoke from the battle crept like mold through the air. He dozed fitfully. And when the sun rose, the smoke had cleared. Men moved about. Rick was glad to see that all the men were friendlies. Cracker looked at him expectantly, and he realized he hadn't even fed her or even given her her water before he fell asleep. She'd saved his life on the Special Forces mission, and he hadn't even remembered to feed and water her. He did both now and then pushed himself up. He started to follow him, or she started to follow him, but stopped to sniff at Tristy. Only Tristy wasn't there anymore. That is, her body was there, but she wasn't. Cracker whimpered and lay down next to Tristy. She pawed again at Tristy like she always did when she wanted to play with her friend. Come, Cracker. Cracker obeyed, but more reluctantly than usual. She wanted Tristy with them, but she had to follow Rick. They kept walking until they reached 2020, lying among the wounded. Blood smell filled the air. The unit must have run out of stretchers because some of the wounded lay on ponchos. 2020 had a poncho both over and under him. Even though his eyes were closed, he still wore his glasses. He didn't seem to be breathing. Rick's own breath caught. He braced himself and squatted down and then took his friend's hand and knelt with his forehead on the, on the hand. What the heck are you doing? I ain't dead yet, 2020 said. Rick dropped his hand and scurried to his feet as if 20 had come back from the dead. His friend tried to push himself to a sitting position. Lie down, Rick said. She's gone, isn't she? His eyes seemed to be blurry. Just lie down, man. 2020 pushed, into his, pushed onto his uninjured elbow and spotted his dog. Her fur matted with blood. He collapsed backward. I told her to stay, he said angrily. Rick wasn't sure whom he was angry at. I heard you. We all heard you. I told her to stay. The intensity of 20's anger was palatable. That means, guys, you could almost feel it, physically feel it. Like you could feel uh, something being rough or soft or smooth. You could feel the anger. Rick wanted to say, but she was only trying to help. Don't be angry at her. But then he decided to leave it alone. She didn't stay, 2020 said. I didn't teach her right. And then Rick realized 20 was angry with himself. She was a good dog. You taught her great. I'm going back to the world, aren't I? The world was what guys called the real world, America. Rick barely glanced around 2020's injured arm. But the glance was enough. Yeah, you're going back home. With how many arms? I don't want to look. Pick up the poncho. You're going to be okay, was all Rick could say. He wanted to look over at 2020's wound again, but he already knew. Worse. 
worse than a million dollar injury. Basically, from the way the poncho lay, it looked like maybe most of Twenty's arm could be gone. Make sure Tristy gets buried properly. Make sure Rick, okay? I will. At the fire base, the old timer dog handlers had already set up a graveyard for the dogs who got killed in action or died of jungle diseases. I want her epitaph to say, sleep well. All right. I'd already decided just in case. Yeah, okay. And, and cut a piece of my hair and bury it with her. Rick took out a knife all soldiers carried and cut off a chunk of Tony's hair. He stuffed it in his pocket. Rick looked out into the field. He couldn't believe what he saw in the distance. Dead bodies, lots of them, beyond the perimeter. Dozens upon dozens of dead VC. Did that mean they had won the battle? It didn't feel like they had won. All right, guys, I'm going to go back up and talk to you about the word epitaph. An epitaph would be like if you've ever been to a cemetery and you've seen on a, a gravestone, it's, it would be like a little um, saying that they've inscribed on the gravestone. Sometimes people who there'll be a scripture or a, a poetry or just some kind of a little verse, a little saying um, will be inscribed. Um, I remember one from when I was a little kid that you saw a lot, uh, walk softly by for I'm only sleeping, things like that. People that it, it gives comfort to the family to see it. Um, a lot of my family epitaphs would be scripture. Sometimes it would be something to help you remember the person, something that represented them. Okay. Cracker sniffed at 2020's arm, blood. She lay down, her head resting on her paws, while the medic leaned over to check 2020. Then she followed while Rick and the medic carried 2020 stretcher and laid him next to a group of other men on stretchers. Other men who smelled like blood and guts and dirt, but they were alive. What's going on? asked 2020. You're going home, buddy. The medevac will be here soon. You'll be fine. There's guys a lot worse off than you. 2020 turned his head away, suddenly crying. She wouldn't listen. He said one last time, it's my fault. Rick said, it ain't your fault. He looked around. I think they want to look you over again. You call me if you need anything. 2020 didn't answer. A man who was clearly badly wounded lay unattended. He looked as if he were made of mud. Rick hesitated and then asked someone, shouldn't the medic be looking over that, over that guy? It's triage man, the other soldier said softly. Triage means when you're in a war situation, um, obviously there's limited resources. There's limited um, doctors. There's limited medical supplies. There's, you know, limited ability to do things in a hurry. So what the doctors and medics will do is they'll look at everyone who's injured once things are clear and they'll assess who can be saved and who cannot. And in who can be saved and who cannot, it's who can be saved the quickest. And they kind of assess it that way. Um, so somebody that's beyond being saved, they might give them something to comfort them, but then they just leave them and go on to somebody else. And then if they get time, they get to them because it's just, if they like, for example, if you just had a deep wound that, and it wouldn't lead to your death if you got it cleaned and stitched up. But if they left you laying and you, and you lost too much blood or you got a really bad infection and then that would cause you to die, it wouldn't make sense if they went over and spent time working on someone who was fatally wounded, uh, trying to save them when you're in the middle of a field and you don't have an operating facility and you don't have all the things that you would have in a normal, um, high equipped hospital, it would be, I don't want to say silly, but it wouldn't make sense to spend time and use supplies on someone that you couldn't save in the middle of a field, in the middle of a jungle, if there was someone with just a deep cut, a deep wound that could be saved. So that's what they would do. They would assess the injuries and save the people that could be saved first. That's what triage means. His eyes are open. Yeah, but Doc has to work on the guys he can save. That one's a goner. Rick looked again. The mud man seemed alert, alert, bizarrely hyper. A poncho covered most of his body. Whatever made the medic determine the guy was a goner was hidden under that poncho. Obviously, it was more than a lost limb. Rick walked over. The sun made the man's brown eyes hold a glimmer of gold in them. The eyes blinked at Rick. And Rick reached for his hand and pressed it. It felt cold. Need anything, soldier? 
He didn't even know the guy's name. As a matter of fact, he probably didn't even know the names of 90% of the guys here. The guy shook his head. He was staring at something. Rick turned to look. It was a bloody thing, a foot lying on the ground. The guy said, is, is that mine? His feet stuck out from underneath the poncho covering his torso. No, you got your legs, Rick assured him. Your feet too. He hesitated and then lied. You're going to be okay. Dust off's coming. Just as he said it, he heard the choppers in the air. He lied again. There are guys worse off than you, so you may not be first. That's okay. Take them first. Rick lit a cigarette and offered it to the soldier. The soldier opened his mouth slightly, and Rick placed the cigarette in between the poor guy's lips. He inhaled deeply. Cracker sniffed at the man, which made him smile. Cracks breaking in the mud on his face. Rick smiled too. Nice dog, the man said. Yeah, she's great. I got an Australian shepherd back home. They're sheep herders, he smiled again. Then the man shuddered. The life drained from his face. The way light drains from the sky at sunset. But it was weird how the sun still glowed off his eyes. Rick hoped his last thought had been of his sheep herder back home. Rick adjusted the poncho where it had fallen loose. He walked away. Lay down in the grass and just stared at the sky as two dust offs arrived together, arrived together the first batch of wounded. Usually the guys would have cheered at the sound, but everybody was so wasted, that means worn out, spent, that nobody made a sound. 2020 remained, but the medic was looking him over, and that made Rick feel a little better. If 20's arm were really bad, he'd be the first to go, probably. Then Cracker actually got up and left him, trotting over to sniff at Tristy before turning to Rick. Woof. He walked over and picked up Tristy, unsure where they should wait. It was odd the way Rick didn't feel anything. It wasn't as if his heart and mind were back at home or with his buddies or his family or anywhere at all. It was as if all his feelings were simply gone. Poof. No feelings at all. Not for 2020. Not for the dead soldier. Not for the dead dog in his arms. He sat down with Cracker and Tristy far away from everybody else. He remembered that not long after the Sarge had first suggested he change dogs, he had gone to sit behind a warehouse. His friends had noticed he'd been gone a while and started calling his name, Rick, Rick, but he didn't answer. He just sat there, not really even thinking about much. He felt kind of that way now. Leave me alone, world. So he just stared straight ahead, numb. Then suddenly he felt and thought everything he hadn't felt just a few minutes earlier. He was so glad that he and Cracker were alive. He thought about his mission with Camel, and he thought about Tristy, 2020, the dead soldier with the sheep herder back home, and how it all sucked. It really, really sucked. But he also had another crazy feeling. It all sucked, but it was just so real. And the fact that it was so real made it suck even more. But it also made it suck less because this was it. This was the biggest stuff that was ever going to happen in his life. And he'd done good. Whatever was it was, generalist or specialist, or applying himself, or none of the above, who knew? All he knew, and he knew it, was that he'd done good. He felt as if his cells physically craved something, but that the only way to satisfy them was not to get something, but rather to sob, which he did. He couldn't even remember the last time he'd sobbed. He thought all the way back to first grade and couldn't remember sobbing. Oh, he'd shed a tear here and there, but full-on sobbing, never that he could remember. He lay down again and waited for the next wave of choppers that would be coming soon to take them back to base. Cracker moved her snout to his chest. Rick smiled and stroked her long ears. That felt nice. And she could tell it made him feel better. Her ears perked up, more choppers. She stood, and sure enough, in a moment, the sky was filled with the sound of metal birds. This time, the men cheered. Rick seemed invigorated, which in turn made Cracker feel invigorated. There were only three choppers. The first chopper, the first dropped off supplies and carried away another batch of wounded men. Rick set Tristy near his rucksack and walked over to the supply drop to grab a couple of canteens of water. He had food in his sack, but he hadn't brought enough water. Cracker followed Rick as he walked away and stopped to pour water in his steel pot. She gulped it down. He drank the rest of the canteen in one go. And then Rick looked over the dead field. It looked like nothing would grow there again for a thousand years. 
Rick. Rick rushed over to where 2020 was just about to be lifted into the dust off. What is it? The chopper blades blasted their hair in uniforms with air. 2020 shouted above the noise, make sure about Tristy. Don't leave her in the field. You got my word. I'll be contacting you. Take care, buddy. Yeah, you too. He weakly reached out his good hand and shook, and Rick shook it. If I don't make it, you're going to make it. Tell my mama. Just tell her the truth. Tell her what it was like. She'd want to know that. You're going to make it. Quit whining. You're going home. You got a million-dollar injury. Rick let his eyes fall just briefly to where 2020's arm should be. I still haven't looked under the poncho, said 2020. The doc will take good care of you. You think? You think you'll save my arm? It seemed like the injured men were obsessed with their limbs. Rick didn't want to out and out lie to his friends, so he said, they got great doctors. I heard one of them was doing his residency at Yale when he got the letter to serve. They ain't slackers. You're going to be lying on the beach with a few, in a few months, sending me a picture from Florida. I'll be just about to de-Ross while you're running around with your girlfriend. 2020 closed his eyes as a couple of men carried him off. Rick could hear 2020 shouting to one of the guys carrying him. For all intents and purposes, these choppers take you to your death and then they save your life. Rick walked with Cracker back to where Tristy lay with her chest caved in. At least it had been fairly fast, he thought. Maybe he shouldn't have given her mouth to mouth. Maybe it just prolonged her suffering. Maybe it was one of those cases where you did the right thing at the wrong time. No, no. He would have done the same for Cracker. If there had been even the slightest chance to save Cracker, he would have tried. He leaned on his back and waited for the chopper that would take them back. Cracker sniffed at Tristy again. She knew Tristy was gone, but she pawed at her to come back. She pawed at Rick to bring Tristy back, but they both just lay there. She whined, but finally lay down. Chopper after chopper arrived, and soon there was just a few men left. Rick had to go last because he had dogs and because he wasn't injured. The Army had priorities. Hurt men, well men. Dead men, well dogs. Hurt dogs, dead dogs. Soon no one else was left, and Rick got ready to climb aboard the last chopper. The pilot shouted, sorry, we're overloaded as it is. No room for the dogs. Two dogs ain't going to make a difference, said Rick. The dead one... The dead one weighed only 50 before she lost blood. Can't risk all these human lives for a dog, dead or alive. Rick just stood there. All right, can you take the live one and I'll stay behind? Sure, we'll send another bird right out. Go on, Cracker, get on the chopper. But Cracker wouldn't budge. He picked her up and threw her on. She jumped right off. He tried again, same result. Get on the chopper, he screamed at her. She pressed against his legs. All right, stay with me, you crazy dog. Rick watched the whirling blades move into the distance. He heard a gunshot from behind him, and he fell t- into the long grass to hide. Down, he cried to Cracker. She obeyed immediately, but he didn't hear anything more. Still, he didn't move. He kept thinking of the way Camel had become a statue. He lay like a fallen statue, the tall grass wavering around him. He knew Charlie would come out to police up any ammo or food the GIs had left behind. As he listened for every small sound that might mean the enemy was near, He didn't and couldn't understand what he was doing here in Vietnam. And then he had a flicker of realization. The flicker grew stronger. He was here to be doing exactly what he was doing, taking his friend's dog on a proper burial. That meant more to him right now than whipping the world. His body involuntarily shuddered as he saw Cracker's ears go up and alert. For a moment, he thought they were both about to die. He breathed very slowly through his nose, not his mouth so as not to stir even the air around him. Then he heard it, the whoop, whoop, whoop of the chopper blades. He shouted for joy.